I'm Bill Kennedy, and welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Today, we have a special guest named Anna Margarita. Hey, Anna. Hey, Bill. Very excited to be on this podcast today. Thank you once again for having me. Thank you for uh, agreeing to talk to us for the next hour. Uh, this podcast is about not just tech. It's really about getting to know people um, that you're seeing every day, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's at conferences. I know you do a lot of conference talks. Um, and so I don't, we don't really know each other. A few of my guests I've, I've kind of met. We don't, and, and that's why I'm really excited because I see uh, you're, you know, I, I follow you because you're doing a lot of exciting things. Also, because I learned that you came from Miami and there's just so few of us from Miami working in the tech that we work in. So I'm super excited to talk to you uh, about that and, and some other things. But just to get started, give everybody your two minute kind of elevator pitch on kind of what you're doing today in tech, right? Like where you are right now. So right now, I am a senior chaos engineer at Gremlin. Gremlin is a startup that is currently based out of San Francisco, California. We help companies avoid downtime by proactively injecting failure into their systems. We are the category leaders in a, in a space in the DevOps community called chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is thoughtful planned exercises in order for you to build more resilient systems. So it's like a really niche phase. I'm super honored to be here. And it's a lot of learning. I'm constantly building demos for our customers. I'm getting ready to create content for like our tutorials and things like that. And I also just spend a lot of time like researching what's going on in the cloud native space and the open source communities that are other tools that I know that the industry is going to start using. So I start taking deep dives into them in order to understand how everything's working. But I will explain later coming from a self-taught background and being curious, but it's so nice to now be able to use a discipline like chaos engineering that allows for me to start breaking the systems and understanding how all these complex portions of distributed systems work together. So it's, it's like I currently love my job and I can't think of like another type of career that I would have chosen for, due to like the personality that I do have. So my brain is already overwhelmed with all of the things you have to be juggling in your head. But the other thing is, like, my first reaction is keep Anna away because she's about to bring our systems down <laughs> and they may not come back up. Right. <laughs> I do hear that often. People are like, stay away from this. Like, you can't break this. Because, like the slogan for my company is break things on purpose. Like we are those chaos makers. We are those misfits that do want to find the vulnerabilities in the systems. So sometimes people tell, tell me that and I'm like, no, but wait, there's a portion of chaos engineering that it's about doing this thoughtfully and planned. So I'm like, I'm not going to break something. I'll let you know that I'm going to do it first, and then we can talk about doing it. So communication is a key element of it. Wow. So this just brought up a, a really funny story. When I moved to Miami in 94, I went to work at a company called Vitas. And during the interview, the person running IT, they had just put in a, a RAID 10 hard drive system for the file system. And during the interview, the guy goes, look, I can pull a drive out and nothing's going to happen. And he pulls a drive out and he pushes it back in. And a minute later, everybody is screaming because the file system's down. Needless to say, the guy didn't last a week after I got hired, but I had never seen anything like it in my life. I panicked, you know, I panicked. Like, what are you doing? It's all good. Okay. But, okay. This is awesome. Okay. So the first question I love to ask anybody I really meet when we're having these types of conversations is to think about and tell me the first kind of memories you have working on a computer. So the first memory is a very interesting story. It's like I grew up in Costa Rica. Um, my parents did have a chance to have a computer and we used it for like emails and my parents were doing like a long distance of like my dad works and live in Nicaragua and we were in Costa Rica. So email was a key element to my parents' relationship and staying in contact with my dad while he was constantly on the road. So with that computer, I remember my parents went out to dinner. I had been grounded. I was with the nanny at home 
And I went onto this computer. This is Microsoft, like Windows, like 98. Can you tell us how old you are as a, as a, as a basic time? I was six, seven. Okay. Wow, six, seven. Okay. I'm going to go on the computer even though I'm grounded because this is who I am. Like, I, I don't always follow rules. I like breaking rules. And I went on the computer. I opened up Microsoft Paint and I decided to do a checkerboard. It was just like blue, white boxes. And I was having a blast. And then I think I thought I tried saving the file into the desktop. Well, it turns out that I actually saved the file as my desktop background. And I was a kid. I don't know how to use computers. I had no idea how to remove this desktop background. So of course, I turn off the computer. My parents come home. I think we were all using the same login. It wasn't like people had their own uh, accounts. So they come home and like they see this checkerboard background, not the regular Windows like desktop uh, background for it. And they're like, who did this? What's going on? Like, I have a brother, so it could have been my brother or myself. And I think my brother may have not been home that day. So instead, they're like, was it you? And I was like, no, it wasn't me. It was my nanny. And I blamed it on my nanny. <laughs> Mind you, my nanny like never touched the computer. But in my head, putting the blame on someone else made a lot of sense as a kid, especially when you're a kid that's already grounded, that you are not supposed to use a computer. And that kind of like became this the story of mine of like, I remember where I created something and I loved it and I was proud of it, even though I was not supposed to create something like I, went, I was OK getting in trouble at that point. Like I, I felt like comfortable with it. And that is like something that I always kind of like look back because I did end up going down like web design and graphic design for a while. And it was always like, no, I was creating art since I was six years old. <laughs> On the computer. Nice. But you got busted at, at the end of the day. Yeah, I try to teach my teenagers all the time. Rule number one, don't get caught. So, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's if you're awesome... going to do something like that, learn how to undo it. And I had no <laughs> idea how to change a desktop background at that time at all. <laughs> wow. So that's like six, seven years old. You're already, um, you know, working with applications and, uh, and you're doing that, which, you know, I guess a little bit, if you think about the kids today with the devices that we have, I mean, kids are starting this at like one or two, but back then it was a whole nother this wasn't a simple device. This was, you had to get a program running, play with the mouse, start doing. Do you, yeah. So do you think you knew how to do that just from, from watching your parents that whole time? Or was it, you just, it just seemed instinctive, right? Maybe. I mean, it's hard to remember that far back. But. Incentive. Like, I think I have maybe used Microsoft Paint like once, but I think I only use like the, the little brush and this time instead I was using the square brush. So this was me experimenting with something new. And I think it's, it's very similar to like, I see my nephews and nieces at like four years old, pick up the iPads of their parents or their iPhones. And they're just going at it, using it better than their parents. And I'm like, you're four years old. How is it that you're born knowing how to use these devices? And I think it's just that intuition that you just kind of like have that curiosity as a kid to dive deep. And because at that time, like that was a computer for me, these kids nowadays have iPads and iPhones to play around with. Like you just already come curious. And I think you start, you start losing the curiosity as you grow up. So it's like making sure you keep it so you can continue having fun stories as like, I was a kid and I broke something and I got in trouble. I got caught. Like I didn't follow <laughs> Bill's teenage advice. So don't get caught. <laughs> You've done that lesson early. All right. So then, so, so that's, that's really interesting. So, when would you say you started your journey into engineering, right? Not just painting a background, but software development or engineering, putting, like whatever that is. I started, I would have been doing all the math of like what school, what grade I was in. I was 12, 13. I started coding at 12, 13. I'm one of those kids. I got a chance to go to a middle school out in Miami, Florida, that they had an introduction to computers class. Mind you, the, the course curriculum says we're going to learn Microsoft Word, PowerPoint and Excel. And that's cool. Like my parents wanted me to do that because they knew that these office skills were going to be useful for me later on in life. So it's like, just get it done with now. 
And I had the best, best computer professor ever, Mr. Rios. He's someone that like drastically changed my life in the sense of because of him, I am the engineer that I am now. And he, apart from teaching us Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint and other programs, he also taught us Microsoft Publisher. So it was this tool that like not many people knew of or anything like that, but it was, he was like create posters, collages on here. And then he taught us how to make like just a Word document pretty, like on the on the Microsoft Publisher. And then he would get the homework and upload it to his website. So he was like, I'm gonna make grab this page, make it an HTML, post it on a website, and you get to go home, tell your parents this is the, the classwork assignment that I did. And I think that was like a crucial point of like me being able to show off my work that was like gave me some form of accomplishment and being proud of what I was doing. And then I was still really curious at that age. And in in um in publisher, there was a button that said insert HTML. And I clicked it and it's like just a white box. And I was like, what is this? So at that time, uh the search engine that I was using wasn't Google or Yahoo, it was altavista.com. Um, so I went on there and I was like, what is HTML? And it's like cool, hypertext markup language. And I'm like, all right. And then it's like you use this with CSS and you build websites. And I was like, okay. And then I go on MySpace, like I'm that MySpace era kid too, where I go on MySpace and it's like, well, you know, you can use your savvy CSS skills and build some really neat as uh, profile pages and put glitter on your little cursor and have your music player actually hidden on MySpace. And like, I started learning how to code because of this. Like I wanted to put fancier things into my homework assignments in sixth, seventh grade, but I also wanted to make my MySpace page really awesome. And as I started making my MySpace layout pretty neat, people started finding out and they were like, hey, can you make me mine? Can you help me with this? So all of a sudden I'm like starting to do code projects for folks. And like a year or two later, like I continue learning more skills in HTML, CSS and JavaScript that I launched my own freelance business by the age of 15. So it was just like everything happened so quick and out of necessity of like, okay, it would be helpful right now, like as my parents are going through a financial situation of like me being able to help out with those things and also start saving money so I can buy technology devices so I can continue learning and get down this path that I've been on. Right, that, that opens up a whole can of worms. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and we're gonna come back. Uh, what year did you graduate high school? Just so I, we can put some, some time around this. 2012. Okay, 2012. So that means that we were talking probably about 2008, not seven, 2006 or, okay. 2007, I launched my freelance business. Okay, 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 okay. So here's a couple of interesting things because as, um, as parents, especially back then, I don't think we fully understood what the internet was gonna be in terms of time, in terms of uh, what you, the good things and the bad things around it, right? Um, my daughter, who was born in 2000, I think I made lots of mistakes with her in terms of tech. But when it came to MySpace, I see that the questions I have there is, were you doing that work at home on the home computer? And were your parents at all monitoring that type of activity and behavior on MySpace? Because that, that's, that's a pretty open platform back then. Yeah, so we had like this is in Miami, we had a computer in my brother's room. And I think that's when I was able to use it. For a while, we also had an office, uh, like an office room that my, my mom was a lot of like word processing Excel sheets type of work. So we were get we would get a chance to use it like it was allocated time of like you have to get your homework done, you can't be grounded. Um, so it was definitely hard to use it. And the supervision came a lot later. Like I definitely got a chance to get away with more things earlier on in, in like MySpace days of like unlimited time on the computer. Then they started realizing that I was spending too much time. So like it was like time box and my parents were smart. I give them credit. And I was also smart. So I, I like I knew how to get away with things really easily. But I eventually got a chance to get a computer in my room because I was starting to have a freelance business, you know, like they wanted to be those parents that were supportive, even though this is like, really, they don't know what's going to happen to this industry or how scary it can be. So 
I my think my mom started finding out that I was on the computer at like 11 midnight. Like I was supposed to be in bed, like to wake up at like six to go to high school. And instead, she realized that they can remove the network card out of my computer and like not have an Ethernet cable. And instead, give me a USB wireless stick. So my network card was a USB device that my mom would hand over to me when I had the privilege to use the internet. And I give them credit. Like, that is genius. Like, it's, it's a different form of parental control. Like, I, I appreciate this hardware driven of like, you're now giving the keys to access the internet now that you've done your homework. Um, but I was a really good kid. I will, I, I got raised with like really good morals and I never felt like I, like I wanted to always do the wrong thing, but I knew better. I knew I was going to get caught because I can't keep lies. So I just always <laughs> didn't do the things that you were not supposed to until like later on. Um, so like eventually I think I like was able to find ways to still be on the internet without the network card. I don't remember what I ended up doing, but then my mom started realizing that I would like stay online but I'll put a towel in my bedroom door so she can't see the light coming out of like my computer. <laughs> and then she realized that I was starting to use text messages and like AT&T used to send you the bill with all the messages and the timestamps. So then it was like, my phone was getting taken away at night. And a lot of it was like, I did meet people online at that time on MySpace. So like, since I was doing MySpace layouts for other folks, I had another MySpace account that it was like open-ended. It wasn't my friends that I was talking to. So I think at that moment, it's, it's very much of like, I'm glad that my parents may have like putting, putting more guardrails on it. Cause when we look at society nowadays, like harassment, bullying, and like the type of exposure that our kids have in the internet, like it's not the best place for them. No, um, your parents were technical. Like when you really step back and think about it, they were they were technical, right? Or were they? They were scrappy. They were scrappy, and they always expected the worst out of me. <laughs> and I did have a brother that was ten years older than me, so I think I never talked to him about this, but I wonder if he had a say into my punishments and like, no, we're gonna get her a wireless USB stick, and this is how you control it. <laughs> that's not now uh, over Thanksgiving. That's the conversation to ask. <laughs> um they, they were they were yeah that's really amazing okay so you're in high school you're getting pretty proficient with html css javascript myspace pages people are paying you to to beef up their presence on the web you're doing this through high school while still trying to uh get computer time at home and finish your high schooling and uh, all the other trouble you're getting into, which is, you know, the busier you are, the better off you are, right? So you're, you're, you're maintaining a, a really busy schedule here. So let's, let's talk about your, your senior year, right? You are, you're doing all this stuff, but you're about to graduate. So you got to start thinking about what's next after high school. So where's your head in terms of what the next step is? And, and, and I'm asking because if you've got a successful business going, Maybe university isn't necessarily at the top of the list because why do I need school? I'm making money already. This is. It's so I'm almost really like you knew me then, Bill. <laughs> like you knew exactly <laughs> where my head was at. Uh, so it was really weird. It was like I, I love my story because it's so untraditional. Like I got to the point that I was like, school. What is the point of school? I'm making money already. You know, like I. What are the the B's and the C's that I can get so I can get my degree, make my parents happy but still get a chance to do what I love. So it, I got to the point of like, I had launched my freelance business like ninth grade. So I'm already having income coming in. I'm putting like helping family, getting more money for my computer. And then I also started working. So I started taking internships in web development and like software engineering in a way. And those were really, really awesome because now I was getting paid on my job getting paid in freelance and still in high school. Like my friends yeah. instead were working grocery store jobs during the summer. And I'm like, no, I'm making the same amount of money, but I work in a cubicle and I love what I do. And around like senior year, like it was nuts. 
I was crazy enough to do my junior year and senior year together. I got out of high school in three years because I was just like, I want more money. I want to be in the field. And senior year was insane. I was like vice president of like uh, clubs in, in high school. I was not, I didn't do an internship throughout the year, but I was like a webmaster for my high school website. We completely rebranded the entire high school website. That was like one of the projects that I did my senior year while I was applying to scholarships, while I was applying to universities and the scholarships that I was applying to, it was also like pretty known stuff like Coca-Cola scholars, Posse scholarship, like opportunities to get like a full ride to university. Cause during like 10th, 11th grade, I wanted to go study architecture. I was like, I want, I like design. I want to be an architect, but I also want to get a web design degree. So like my, my dream school was to go to uh, Rhode Island, um, like RISD, because they also had a bachelor's with Brown University. So you can get like an engineering degree and a web design degree. And the other dream was to go to SCAD in Savannah, uh, like just design. Like it was something that caught my eye and my dad stopped me and he's like, you can't go to school for something you already get paid to do. And that's kind of like when it clicked, I was like, all right, so I already know how to do web design, graphic design. I have those skills. I have a business going. What else can I do? So I mentioned that I had gotten internships in high school. It was the South Florida Educational Federal Credit Union. So I got so lucky. It was two other Latina engineers that were with me in that team and a Latino manager. So I, I looked towards them and I'm like, what did you all study? They were like, oh, we studied computer science, computer engineering. Up to 11th grade, I had never heard of this degree. And I was like, wait, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to learn more codings. I want to build more applications. I want to have continue having jobs like this. So I ended up deciding to study computer science. I got a full ride to go over to Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And then I also got a full ride to stay in Miami. And if I stayed in Miami, I would get a chance to get paid to go to school. So I went to Miami-Dade College, the Honors College. And their Honors College is very much of like, you focus in school, we give you a stipend for your books, and you also get any scholarship back. So I had gotten like a few scholarships back. So I was getting paid to go to school and actually focus on that. But of course, because I was so hungry to continue learning and working, I did a lot. I was like, I interned at Google my freshman year of college. I kept working with them for the later two years. I was still interning at the credit union. I was still trying to do freelance. I was joining like high school mentorship programs, even though I was a college freshman. And it was like, I was always busy. Like I felt like busyness was just, I had to keep doing it because it had been a huge part of my success. So it's like all that time, it was really, really a lot. And then Miami-Dade College is a two-year university uh, college. And then you transfer to a four-year school. So I decided to do that. I had all these dreams of going to all these universities. And like my dad passed away that year, my my dad died in Nicaragua, so I had to leave the country. And that messed up my college transcript because the grades were getting sent in. So my college admissions were getting rescinded. I was coming back to Detroit because I was interning at Quicken Loans at that time. So like life is on fire and I end up like, I had submitted a few applications, but I didn't finish my applications. But one of the universities, two of the universities that had accepted me was University of California, San Diego and University of California, Santa Cruz. And my dream was always California. Like I had a, I had to work with Google and I was like, Silicon Valley is my dream. I want to be one of the people that help change the ratio of women in the technology industry. I want to make sure that there's more Latinas and black people in this industry. So that was like a huge passion of mine. I found my college uh, admission like uh, essays and like it's at the last paragraph of it. Like I want to help create change in this industry because it it's 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 something that was a huge passion of mine so I end up taking my opportunity to come out to University of California Santa Cruz to study computer science so I transferred in 2015 um, and I stayed in school eight months I realized I was miserable I realized that school just wasn't for me so I decided to drop out I had already gotten full-time software engineering job opportunities and it was like no, Anna, you say no, because you need to go get that college degree. I come from a Latino household, like get that paper degree is the thing your parents strive for as an American dream. Like they want a better life for you. 
So having to tell my family, oh, no, sorry, I'm leaving school because I'm going to go pursue my career that I can get more money. Like it was really, really weird. And I'm really glad that I did it because I was miserable. I was at that time, I didn't understand what mental health depression was and all this. And like, it was a really bad time for me. And I left school and I went to uh, work at Uber as a software engineer. Like I knew what I was worth. Like I was just like, I am miserable, but I know I love coding and I can do that. So what is my path here? Who do I need to contact? And in part of that, like it wasn't easy. One of the things that I, I got lucky is that I had a good mentor that allowed for me to build a professional brand around myself early on. But then I was also curious. So I joined Twitter in like the first two years that Twitter was around And I used Twitter to my advantage to network, to try to find like the tech community in Miami. I was like a huge part of like hashtag Miami tech, like growing that out, all the conferences. And because of that, I got to meet people that were connected to the Silicon Valley industry. And then I started realizing that there was a huge community of Latinos here, but I didn't know anyone. So then I started looking for Latinos in the Bay Area that were working at companies. And then I start meeting people through Twitter. So I start forming these friendships when I'm based out of Miami and I'm like, I want to be there, but I'm here. What do I need to do? So like things kind of started lining up and I was able to come back out and like I've stayed here since then. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, A lot to unpack. I have a very untraditional story and I'm so proud of it because it's like it was a lot of struggles and failures and like having to figure out what tools do I have near me that I can use for my advantage. So what I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things I could talk, ask you, but what what I want to focus on for me, what I find interesting is being in Miami, which honestly, I've been here since 94. It's not a tech city that like you see in California, like you see in Colorado, like you see in New York, it, just, it, it isn't right yet. You were able to get access to these internships and jobs from here. And I find that completely fascinating because that's not, one, it's not necessarily obvious. And two, it's not necessarily easy. So how was it that you identified these opportunities while being in Miami? And was it as simple as just applying for? Like, this is mind blowing to me that you had access to things that in my world here, people just don't have access to because we don't live in California. Just focus on that a little bit. What was it that you were doing to find these opportunities um, for these internships like Google and, and, and the rest of it? Yeah, so in high school, I went to a magnet school. So I went to a school that you that had a specific focus on information technology. So I did get web design, graphic design classes in high school. But the classes, it was knowledge that I already had. I had already learned this. I was just there to do the the assignments and leave. And that the teacher started realizing that. So they gave me more opportunities. They allowed for me to get certified in Adobe Dreamweaver, Photoshop, Flash. So I started getting certifications under my name like really early on. And I was like, this helps people get jobs. So all of a sudden, my resume is getting really beefed up. I was doing a lot of community work, like building websites for organizations, too. So by the time, oh, so the other thing is that the high school that I I went to is part of something called National Academy Foundation. Fast forward to now, I now sit on the board for them and they're an organization that helps high school students be career ready at a really young age. So the high schools are geared towards, you take one of your electives, whether it's information technology, engineering, hospitality, finance, business, and then you become a graduate within this organ with this organization. But one of the key elements of NAF is that you spend one summer doing an internship. So they have partners every in so many of these cities. There we're around in all the United States, and there's high schools that are are geared towards this. So they have partnerships with Carnival. They have partnerships with the Miami Aquarium, with the Software Educational Credit Union, Perry Ellis. Um, there was a whole bunch of little organizations that had a few high school interns. And I was one of those lucky few that was able to get an internship in IT. So by the time that I get to freshman year of college, I had already gotten on Twitter. And I was like, 
I want to work at Google. Like my college essay says, I want to work at Google. To me, it's insane that I still had this really high reach goals. And I got that in my freshman year of college. And I was just like, I went on Twitter and I looked up Google internships and I started finding the links to apply. Like I didn't, I didn't know that Google had a whole bunch of programs geared towards students because I had no knowledge. Nobody told me that. So in Twitter, I was able to find them and I applied. And it was that thing where I wasn't going to apply because Miami-Dade College is a two-year university. And guess what that application said? You need to have a four-year degree. Like you need to be in a four-year university. So I was like, I am already disqualified. I met every other qualification. So at that time, my best friend was like, no, girl, like you're doing it. And I was like, no, but my computer science teacher won't write my recommendation. She's like, have you tried? And I was like, I haven't. So I go to his office hours and I was like, hey, Eric, how do you feel about build, like writing a recommendation for me? I've only been in your class three weeks, but look, I've been a freelance developer for all these years. I'm only here because I need a degree. He wrote the recommendation. I got into this internship program. It was 30 students were in my cohort. Everyone was from an Ivy League. I was the only community college student. I was the only Latina in that room. And everyone's like Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, like the dreams of like going to those schools, like those were things that I always had. And I was like, I just got the same opportunity that a Harvard MIT kid got, like, damn. And it was because of being curious of like, what tools do I have near me that can help me get there? And like, Twitter was that for me. Like I was able to network. I was able to find links to those applications, but I also found ways to make myself stand out. Like my resume, it's built on like Adobe InDesign. Like it's really pretty. And it's, it's, it's when you think about recruiters only having 10 seconds to look at your resume, mine stood out. My business card was the exact same design as my resume and my website had the same color scheme. So it was like, because personal branding was something that I found attractive and fun, it made me stand out. Wow. So this is amazing because what, what's the organization is, you said it again? National Florida. Academy Foundation. The website is naf.org. Okay. So, you know, what you're describing, I'm going to date myself a little bit, even though I didn't go to high school in the 60s. In the 60s, high schools were designed around preparing you for the job market. You didn't necessarily go to university. You didn't have to. The, the, they were very career oriented in the 60s. There were a lot of, and what I'm hearing is, is that your, this, or, your, this organization is kind of bringing that back. And I think that's really amazing because I, I, from what I'm hearing, I mean, that's really contributing a lot to um, where you were at the end of high school and the beginning of university at least, right? To get you to a place that you probably wouldn't have been at if you had gone to South Miami High School, right? Yes, exactly. And that, that was my major reason for going back and volunteering with them through after all these years, because it was like, I am a product of the mission of this foundation of like, kids need to be career ready, the earlier, the better. So if I was able to find my passion in middle school. Some people can't find it until they get to their master's degree. So the closer you get to have these kids start thinking about what do I want to do for 30 years of my life in my career? Like what is going to make you feel happy, get money and like make you feel fulfilled. And I do think that we need to start bringing that back, uh, especially in the current job market where like technology is something that is so needed, but it's also like every industry should, should have opportunities for people to break in with a different type of non-traditional learning. So that's kind of like where NAF kind of fits in. You get those internships of what the traditional day-to-day -day looks like in that industry as an accountant, as an engineer, as a, like, I'm blanking out on like other things, like people working in hospitality business, so like all the hotels and tourism out in Miami, like they had academies for that. So the internships were really geared towards like, this is what you would do in 10 years if you were to pursue your college degree, you know, like that's kind of what they tell you in your internship. And to me now, like that, that sometimes doesn't happen. And I think in, in this pandemic world, like we can push for it to be more 
because we have those resources. Everything is virtual. Like people can actually explore a lot more. But a lot of it comes to you don't know that you can do certain things because you're not exposed to it. And it goes back into like representation being really important because like if I would have never met those engineers in my internship, I would have never learned about computer science. In my web design class, nobody came to talk to me about like, hey, Anna, you can get a, a computer science degree or anything like that. So the same kind of applies to you don't know that you can go be a paramedic if you've never met someone that looks like you that works in that field. You don't know that you can be a, a music artist or a producer or an actress because you don't see someone that looks like you in that industry. So part of it was getting ready to think about careers at early age, but a lot of it also comes with like, is there someone that I can look to as a role model in this space? So I want to, there's too many things now I want to explore here. And I, 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 I don't always track that one, but I, I just want to, two things. So the one thing I tell my kids all the time is if you don't ask, you can't receive. God. My dad told me something similar. And that is like, I, there's like various things that my dad told me at a young age that I think really helped shape me. One of it was every single door is closed. You have to go knock on it and see if it's open. It doesn't cost anything to go knock. So it was like, always apply to everything. Always go try something. But you applying for the internship is pretty much in line with those ideas because you weren't going to do it. But for, for 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 whatever reason, eventually you do it. You you ask, and you receive there. And then I'm I'm actually curious. You're in a room now, interning with kids from all these Ivy League schools, which must have been somewhat intimidating. But at some point, you must have realized that they were no different than you, in terms of where you were in, in knowledge and ability. Right? Like at some point. I have to imagine that that light bulb turns on. Talk a little bit about that. It was weird because I felt out of place. I didn't know what that meant. I was like, I don't I don't know your friends. I don't take data structures my freshman year of high school. I take introduction to C++. So like even ter in terms of curriculum, like I felt so left out because Miami Dade College wasn't teaching a structure that they do in four year universities. So I didn't fit in. And I also was like really shy. I've always been a really shy person. And I just felt weird. And I think a lot of it was like, because I was the only Latina, like I realized that I just didn't look like anyone. Everyone was a little more privileged. Like I just was different and I didn't understand what that meant. So that triggered like imposter syndrome for like many years. And like, I did that internship at Google. I went to Quicken Loans. I worked at a, a startup in Miami. I would go to tech conferences. I stayed working for Google. And I just always looked around and like, I never felt like I fit in there. And that became more apparent at Uber. Like Uber really brought it to the flesh of like, you're not like these people. Like you're, you're very different. Like you're you. And I didn't realize that I can bring my whole self everywhere I went. And it was weird because in, in that portion of like, having the same skills like I knew I knew that I had gotten the resume for it I put in my time in learning all these programming languages putting my projects out there that I knew I deserved to be there but I didn't feel like I belonged and it was just like should I leave and like when I when I work at Uber like that's a whole other story but it really made me want to leave the tech industry I the amount of times that I was crying because the job was toxic. I hated my job. Like I remember calling my mom one day and I was like, Hey mom, I'm leaving tech. I'm going to go work in marketing. Like I, it's something I already kind of do and I'm good at. I can't do this tech thing. And a lot of it was just cause I didn't find the space. So I started finding like more Latinos that work in this space and started to like be with them a lot more and like really find a place that I fit in where it was like, no, you get to continue being as loud Latina that you want. One of my passions was like dressing up really nice and doing a full face makeup, but I had stopped doing that because it led to more sexual harassment. So it was like, how is it that I can get out of the situation to go back to being happy and do things that I find that a lot of passion in? 
All right, let me, I want to explore some of that too. We're not going to have enough time on this podcast to talk about everything I want to talk, talk to you about. But I'm curious, I want to ask some hard questions here. You were at an early age in a, in a tech space that was predominantly privileged, probably a lot of white men privileged, Northeast, maybe California, right? Um, but you broke down doors through the, the entire story that, that you, you told me, right? And I'm just, do you think at that point, is there a lack of, of the Latino community there, mainly because um, of the cities that the majority of Latinos living in, not really having that type of access to that tech? Do you think it's like you broke through, but do we? Do you think it's that? What is it that you think maybe is holding back having more Latinos in the space that you broke into? We, we people weren't open to having other people in the room, as in like they weren't inclusive, like whether it was racist comments or like non welcoming type of language around it. And secondly, it goes back to these are career paths that we're just not exposed to. You don't have a dad that was an engineer at IBM. You don't know an uncle that was able to have an Apple computer. And like those things are so not in line of sight for us whatsoever. We don't grow up close to the technology industry whatsoever. The technology industry has been white prominent, like prominently based out of Silicon Valley. And when you think about even the immigration patterns, like there wasn't that many like Latinos coming out to Silicon Valley, like they were going down to LA. And if they were out in San Francisco, San Francisco was so far away from Silicon Valley in that moment that those things weren't there. And there were a lot of other Latinos that came before me that broke in, but I hadn't met them. So I always felt that I was one of the only ones and I had to like brute force my way into it. I had someone that told me you fake it till you make it. And I thought that was the best advice that I was ever given. I look back at it and I think, I don't like tell people to do that. I think by faking it till you make it, you lose yourself. You stop bringing yourself to work. You stop listening to how you actually feel. And you're literally putting a happy face in and you're following the American dream. Like you're following what the traditional white privileged person does when our cultures and ourselves were so different and we don't let ourselves choose our own path. Because we feel like, The only path to make it to Silicon Valley is the white male path. And we try to fit in. And all of a sudden you can't fit in because we're not like them. So it's a lot of like you having to realize if if you're in that pattern, like you have to realize it yourself and like break out of it. But then it came to this whole, like, I need to be louder. Like I need to advocate for this more because there is it's not fair for other people that want to break in that they're like, oh, I'm not going to do it because there's no one else that's going to welcome me. And I'm like, no, we're here. We're, we're loud. We're proud. We're small. But we need more Latinos, more people of color in this industry. So I've kind of like made that my story where I'm like, no, I, I faked it till I made it. And then I made it and I burnt out. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to talk about that now. So it's 2016 and you're at Uber. Right. You, you've decided that you're not going to finish that university degree. It's and you, you were forcing yourself down that path because you thought that's what you had to do. And then you finally realized, look, it's not about what I have to do. It's about my, my happiness, my my well-being. I'm, I'm ready. You go out, you get you jump back, you get into Uber. And you're having problems at Uber in terms of not fitting in again, because you're the only Latino Latina in the room, right? And you said you were ready to quit a couple of times. What was it that allowed you to keep? How how long were you at Uber for? So from sixteen to two two years. So okay, so for like say sixteen to eight, what kept you there? How did you how did you stay there for two years and not quit the industry? Thank God you didn't quit. Uh, uh, What like? And I want, I'm asking the question in case somebody's listening to this right now and unfortunately having some similar experiences and ready to quit. And we don't want anybody to quit. So, what kept you? Because there's this beautiful light at the end of this tunnel that we're trying to get to in the next 20 minutes. And so, what kept you there for the two years? What kept, what got you to that next, 
at next door? So two things. One of it was community. I was able to tap into the Latino and tech community out here in San Francisco. So there's a community called Tequeria. It's basically a Slack community that's just like Latinos across the globe that work in tech. And there's Code 2040. Code 2040 is an organization that I got a chance to learn about when I was in Miami. And I helped them with like a lot of volunteering events. But they do a summer internship program with fellowships. So I was able to meet a lot of those fellows and become like best friends with them. And they knew what was going on at Uber, like publicly, the company was going through through some rough stuff. And they knew me, they knew who I was before I joined Uber. They, they, they had gotten a chance to meet me through these communities. And they were just like, you don't deserve this type of treatment. You don't deserve this type of toxic work environment. Like you can do better, Anna. And there was Stockholm syndrome around all that, where I was like, no, like this is the best thing for my resume. Like, this is what I need to do. This is not as bad. Worse people have, like people have it worse. So I like tried once again to continue making it. And a lot, it was like an egotistic thing where it was like, my dream was to work at Google. I got a chance to work at Google too early. So what thing do I put on my resume on top? And it was like, I need to go to this unicorn worth billions of dollars and I need to stay there. And until I was able to get off my my big horse of like, I need to do all these things is that I started to realize, no, I know my worth. I know that there are other companies out there that are going to treat me better. Things that I report to HR are actually going to get taken care of that I don't need to be putting 60 hours when I'm getting paid for 40. Like it was kind of like realizing my worth, but I couldn't realize my worth without my community. And another portion of it too, is that I needed to seek change. So when all of this is going on, like the culture is like publicly known that it's really terrible for minorities. I had to be public about it. And when that publicity kind of came out, I was like able to share my story around like what it was like to be a site reliability engineer at Uber, but also being careful with how much I was sharing because of like legal stuff going on. So I ended up finding lawyers that I talked to and I was like, I need to find a silver lining to this situation. And the silver lining was we're going to lead a class action lawsuit against Uber for discrimination on equal pay, discrimination against female software engineers Latinos, Black, Native American, and mixed race. And we ended up settling for $10 million, like around that basis of you didn't pay minorities the same amount that you were paying your white males and in actual salary and in actual stock. And part of that class action included another portion around hostile work environment. If you had gotten like harassment, discriminated in other ways apart from equal pay, you submit into it. And with that lawsuit, one of the things was that I didn't want an NDA. I wanted to be able to share my story of what it's like to pursuing legal action against a Silicon Valley giant to, hey, you don't have to take crap from anyone to, no, we need to hold people accountable. Like we belong in this space. And if you want inclusive technology, we need to be part of the solution, but you also need to change your ways and allow for us to seek that change. All right, we got 15 minutes left. I want to la- I want the last 10 minutes to talk about Gremlin and 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 that stuff. So, in the in these next five minutes, I, I the question that pops into my head, and I didn't know any of this. This is why I don't like doing research. I like hearing people's stories and where they go. Were you worried at any given time going into a lawsuit that was going to be pretty visible? That you were eventually that you could have been blacklisted or 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 kind of put on a list of do not hire, uh, depending on the direction. Like we, You must have been, I would have been, I'm already nervous, my stomach hurts, thinking about the outcomes of this when you decided to, to do it. Like, like, I mean, it takes, it takes guts. I mean, that wasn't. Yeah. So I was so afraid. I actually had talked to a few other like people of color in the industry, like that were starting to create their own startups that they were known in the startup space. And I was like, I want to sue. But I don't, I want, I, my, one of my career goals is to have my own startup. And one of the advices that someone that I respect very much gave me was, hey, Anna, don't sue. The same investors that are giving money to Uber are going to blacklist you and not going to invest in your company five years from now. That scared me. So instead, I told people that that scared me. 
so I mentioned Code 2040. Uh, I became really good friends with the CEO, Carla Montesaro. And I told her about this. I was like, I want to sue, but I don't want to sue because those investors are not going to give me money. She gave me the best advice. She's like, if they're going to judge you for holding a company accountable based on discrimination, you don't want their money, Anna. And I was like, I don't. If you're not able to understand why I'm standing up against discrimination and bringing more people of color and inclusive spaces into technology, I don't want your money for my company. So that is what made it click. I think three days after I went back to the lawyer, signed everything, and we pursued action. And it was scary. I was going through a terrible depressive episode. I ended up hospitalized a few times through the hot lawsuit. Uber was doing some really shady things that made everything worse. And I then also had that thing where I was seeking change, but I was willing to stay at Uber. I was holding the CTO, uh, Tuan. I was holding the CEO, Travis, accountable. I was talking to HR, like VP Leanne, and I'm like, show me the receipts. This is everything y'all have done wrong. How are you going to change the ship around? So because I was so involved and trying to still do engineering, trying to still fight for diversity and inclusion, I completely burnt out. And then through all the mental health programs and like the lawsuit and stuff, I realized that I couldn't stay there. I realized that my fight was over. The lawsuit was the best thing that could have come out of it because it was giving money back to the people that didn't get paid. But we also put systematic changes in place of like, you need to have more mentorship for minorities. You need to actually uh, create programs around this and give bonuses be- based on like DNI initiatives. So I knew that that was my time. It had ended. So I was able to start being like, I need to start looking for a new job, but I don't know where to look. So when I started my search was around the time that Gremlin came around. And I, my manager, like the person that I ended up joining Gremlin for was Tammy Bryant. And she was very much of like, I had met her two years before when I moved to San Francisco. And she's like, Anna, what do you do? And I'm like, I do chaos engineering at Uber. I'm like, what do you do? She's like, I do chaos engineering at Dropbox. And I was like, no, you don't. Only Netflix does chaos engineering. And she's like, (laughs) no, other companies do. So fast forward two years later, she's like, Anna, I'm leading a chaos engineering workshop for 250 engineers. Do you want to come do it with me? And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Sure, why not? Like, it's a free ticket to SRECon and I get to learn. But I was so scared. I was like, Tammy, I don't want to teach 250 year old, like 250 people that are cis admins for 20 years how to do this. So she's like, You've done this before, Anna. Believe in yourself. You got this. And we got a chance to run that three hour workshop. I started talking to companies at that conference. I tweeted out, like, I'm looking for a job. And then Tammy looks at me. She's like, You want to talk to her CEO? So the next day I talked to Colton Andrews and he's like, hey, Anna, do you want to interview? And I did my interview loop and I was like, I straight up told this to founders. I was like, I'm going through a lawsuit. Like, you do understand that that's on my record. Like, as public knowledge. Like, how comfortable do you feel with this? And they were like, you're doing what's right. We're going to stand behind you. Like, I found the spot that was willing to take me with me standing up and being an advocate and being loud. Because guess what? I was doing the right thing. And if a company is going to look the other way because you held another company accountable, you can probably find another place. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing story. Yeah, I love. Okay, so this is so much, but I want I want to make sure we talk a little bit. And I didn't know you were working with or or with or for with Tammy. I didn't know that. That's yeah, I I love everything that Tammy's doing. Um, I don't know why I never made that connection. And so I'm going to go back on Twitter now and stitch that together. Um, I got to get Tammy on this, on the podcast too. Um, but all that. Okay. So I, I, w- I want to spend this last nine minutes we have talking about chaos engineering, because uh, I, I think we could agree in this bold statement that not enough companies are doing it. And we've probably got a lot of, I always say, if you're if you're an engineer and you're not walking down the street waiting for the lights to shut off because you know everything's being held by band aids, rubber bands, and bubble gum, then you're just not engineering yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I try to tell people too. I go, trust me that even at Google, there's a Gmail engineer running down the hall at least once an hour because something's down. 
So even though those systems look like they never go down, somebody doesn't have email right now. It's just not you, right? Um, and I, I think engineers need to hear that sometimes because we're, we're in an industry where like we're being asked to be perfect every time we sit in front of the keyboard, even when we're typing out code or we're typing out something, like we're being asked to be perfect. It's impossible. So, so, um, so this is why I want to last, the last eight minutes here, right? Because we have production systems here at Arden. We're not doing anything to even breathe heavily on them. So if somebody wants to get into this space where they really want to make sure that um, their systems are handling all the chaos, like what are the what are the first steps? What what do you do? What do you how, how do you start this and not my stomach hurts just thinking about it already, by the way. It, my stomach hurts. So how do you, how do you go about doing this at, at a high level? Like, what's the plan? So part of it is like, it's a culture change. It's starting to accept that failure is okay, that our systems are going to break and it's cost, gonna cost us a lot of money. So how is it that we can break our systems on purpose so that when they do break, it breaks in a smaller scale or it doesn't cost as much money or the engineer actually knows how to fix it because our these are complex distributed systems and like as you mentioned like if you're not that engineer that's thinking everything's going to break how do i fix it you're not engineering right like that is really on brand because this software is all brittle like it's all just binary code of on and off and one little failure is a cascading failure across your stack so part of it is starting to have those conversations of like, things are gonna break, how do we handle them? How do we make sure we're not throwing blame around? And how is it that when it fails, we're learning from it? So part of it can just be as like, let's look at our past failures and have discussions around that. And then start having that conversation. If we were to recreate the conditions that caused this incident, this outage, how would we do that? And then or would we be resilient to it? So looking at that past incident of like, oh, one of my systems went down and my website stopped loading. What can you do to make sure that you have another backup system running that that website is never going to go down? And when you're actually looking at doing chaos engineering, it's a way to learn more about your system by using science. So you use a scientific method, you come up with an experiment, you create a hypothesis, you have things that you're going to be observing, you have conditions that are going to cause you to stop an experiment and you do every single experiment at a small scale. If you don't know how it's going to behave when you only target one application, one host, don't go ahead and run it on 100% of your hosts across your fleet. And it goes back to, you start small. I go ahead and I increase 10% on my CPU just to make sure that maybe I have another host coming up if this one maximizes on, on resources. And then you go ahead and you inject 20% after you be, be successful. So a lot of it is just like slowly, slowly ramping up. So it is a long roadmap of building reliability. But at the end of the day, the end of the tunnel is that you're going to have less incidents your engineers are going to be trained properly. Your mean time to detection is going to be smaller because you fine tune your monitoring. And overall, your engineers might be happier because they have less burnt out because they're getting paged less. They have less pager fatigue. So a lot of it is just like getting started with a conversation of like, are we okay with talking about failure a lot more? Like we know that systems, whether it's people or nature, after they fail, they like, learn how to bounce back and be better. And that's exactly what we're doing by doing chaos engineering. You're injecting failure in order to be more resilient later. All right. In, 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 in one minute here on this question, how important is it to be architecting your systems early on for this? Because if you have to be able to affect 10% of your workload with the idea that then 10% is about to get a 500, Right. Like you have to have some architecture in place to be able to do that as well. Right. So how important is it to architect in the beginning for this? Or is it OK to come back in later, re-architect how things are laid out? 
my personal opinion is that it should be done as early as possible, whether you're building an MVP of a startup, whether you're only a company that has only one Kubernetes cluster and thinking of like scaling in the next few years, making sure that you're resilient to those early failures. Like, why not? Like, get the work done in now because it's going to pay off later. And it's just asking yourselves, what happens if X goes down? I expect Y. And then you can start really architecting of always having that redundancy, making sure that things are gracefully degrading and that you're always thinking about that user experience, that the systems are not down and that your customers and your user base are able to do what they came to your organization to do. So what I, what I, what I love about this entire hour that we've had is that you found a job where you're allowed to go and break stuff scientifically, but you're like in a world of, of chaos, which has seemed to be in your personality from the time you were six with that checkerboard, right? And I think this is, and I see a smile on your face. This is kind of where you're happy because you're allowed to um, be in this environment that allows you to be yourself. Yeah, that's definitely true. Like I, I thrive in chaos, but a lot of it was... I also love engineering. I love design. I love being a people person. So being able to find an organization that was able to create a role for me that allows for me super cross-functional, public facing, and still get engineering done work, like engineering work done. It was like perfect, perfect fit. Amazing. And it all came out of Miami, which to me is... Yes. Miami okay. is my, my stamp, stamping ground for like learning how to tech. Like in Central America, like we didn't have access to this and Miami allowed for those opportunities to kind of come up and for me to meet the right people to mentor me in order for me to be the woman leader that I am, like trying to get more Latinos into the space. And I wish we had more time to explore that. So I think at some point I'm going to have you back because there's just so much here to, uh, to unwrap, but we are out of time. So do me a favor, uh, just Quickly tell everybody where they can find you or how they can maybe contact you if they're interested in any of the things that we talked about today. And we'll get those in the show notes. Yes. So I would say best way to contact me is Twitter. My handle is Anna underscore M underscore Medina. That handle is also usable on Instagram. You can also find my website at AnnaMMedina.com. It links to my LinkedIn, my Facebook. There's a contact form on there. So feel free to reach out if you got a chance to listen to this podcast. Say hi. Um, I can always send out more resources if you're ever interested in learning about anything else that I mentioned in this podcast. Brilliant. Okay. And that's all the time we have. Oh, Eric, I want another hour. All right. So... This is, uh, this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast with our special guest, Anna Margarita, signing off and hope to see you all again real soon. Mm-hmm.